Hey folks, Matthew Lanigan here with Baywa. I see people are still signing in, so we'll just give it another minute and we'll be back with our friends at S5. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi hey folks, Matthew Lanigan here again with uh, Baywa RE. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer here with Baywa. Really appreciate you all taking the time to be with us and our excellent partner, S5. A couple of things before we get going. Uh, this will be recorded, so we will share it uh, via our monthly newsletter. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. If you haven't signed up for our YouTube channel already, we'd really appreciate it if you did. You can see this webinar as well as all our past webinars. Uh, we will be doing questions. We'll do our best to take them on the fly. Um, if I could just have somebody say hello in the question box, just to make sure that it's working down in the bottom right corner. Great. And yeah, uh, continuing education is a big part of the culture here at Baywa. So we're really happy to be able to extend some uh, to you folks. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Mark with S5, the Director of Strategy and Market Development. S5 is a tremendous partner. We've been dealing with them in one way or another for over a decade. My personal experience with them goes back even further than that, but really, truly one of the top-notch uh, solar companies in the business. Without further ado, Mark. All right, great. Thank you, Matt. Um, and th thank you, Matt and Baywa, for letting us um, do this. Um, again, you know, you guys are very cool as well. Um, and, you know, we're really happy to work with Baywa. Um, so let me show my screen. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we can yes. see it. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm Mark Guys. Um, from S5. I've been at S5 five years now, more than five years, and I've been in solar for more than 15 years, actually, <laughs> a long time. Um, and all of it has been with racking, a lot of it with, um, you know, uh, application engineering, codes and standards. So really where the rubber meets the road with solar, attaching solar to roofs. Um, so uh, let's dive into this. 
so as we as I get going, um, first of all, this co course is actually NAPSEP rated, so I can give you I can give out an hour and a half of, ex of educational credit for NAPSEP. So please, though, email me. Um, mgeis at s-5.com to ask for that. Otherwise, I won't do it, but I ask where if you get, get a hold of Emma or Matt, they can pass it on to me. So please do that, but this is an APSEP um, credited course, okay? So I'd like to start with this picture because um, it's a really a beautiful building and it's a nice, nice little, um, uh, you know, installation of solar. It also shows what we're gonna be getting into too, snow retention. At the bottom leading edge, you see, um, uh, our a color guard, our product, and um, you know we'll be talking about both because as you can see, as we know, uh, snow slides off metal roofs, and you really need to control that sliding to protect that stuff that's below it without getting wrecked. And by putting solar on it, it really does not change it that much. So you, it's still important to manage with steep slope metal roofs and putting solar on it, it's still important to manage the snow and we'll kind of get into that along the way. So the objectives today, we really wanna talk about um, solar on metal roofs. That's gonna be rail systems, as well as um, a direct attach our own PV kit, which is a um, railless product. We're gonna talk extensively about that. And then we're gonna get into how, how really snow retention and uh, snow fits in well, which is a really good topic um, in, uh, in Canada. So I'm going to give you a little teaser of something to come later to show with this snow coming off this roof. So this was Brandon's suggestion, my colleague Brandon, um, who's in sales here, said show that first to get everybody excited. So I hope it did. <laughs> anyway, um, so what about metal roofs? So, um, you know, the reason metal roofs are the best place to put solar is that they last forever. Um, the metal roofs have been around forever. These are, you know, very old buildings, as you know, um, that and, and, you know, Notre Dame burnt a few years ago and it's being rebuilt. But, you know, metal roofs are last very long. Um, and that's the key to why they're a good um, platform for solar. Um, just that durability, the service life of, of, you know, metal roofs are between 16, 70 years, even lasting longer than that if they're well maintained. Um, and, you know, whether it be a coated steel or other products, um, metal roofs are really highly durable. Um, this chart, you know, is not necessarily up to date. This is from 10 years ago. Um, some of these other roofing systems have got, have improved, but the basic premise is there is that you want to just look at a service life of solar that you want to install and compare it across the roof systems that are out there. Obviously, you know, metal roofs, steel roofs um, are really the only ones that will outlast um, a solar system, um, statistically anyway. Um, and, you know, and this is one of the reasons I'm in this space is because of this, you know, this this kind of um, thought, thought, this concept. So, um, and besides um, the durability, the sustainability, it's highly recyclable. It's, it is the most recycled roof there is. Um, and so if you combine the durability, the long life with um, just recyclability, you do not see metal roofs and landfills. And you can't say that for other types of roofs. So, you know, we're in this space of solar for, you know, um, to improve our environment. And part of that is, um, you know, getting other types of roofs out of landfills. So this really dovetails well with the reason why I'm in solar as well. So uh, metal roof is just a great fit. So then cost is another, is, that, is another big advantage. You know, it may cost more to put a metal roof up initially. These are kind of roundabout numbers. They're not exact numbers, um, but the, the premise is there. The ratio is there. Installing solar on metal roofs, especially with a rail system, is oh, it net net less. So by the time you get a metal roof and you put solar on it, you're, you know, you're at this very similar or less cost than an asphalt roof with solar on it. But then if you take into consideration having to re-roof and we'll get and we'll show that you know roofs these other types of roofs don't last so it's put, there's a potential or a likelihood that you're going to have to do some repair or replacing a roof and then that cost is is the life part of that life cycle cost of solar on you know, asphalt or other types of roofs or single ply membrane and you just do not see that with with standing seam metal roofs so the, you know this is another good view of that another way to look at it is 
you know, you guys are all used to this line. This is, uh, you know, the cash flow analysis of a solar system over the years. So you have that initial investment at the left. At some point, these numbers just don't look at the numbers, just look at the curve. At some point, you get a break even, and then you're kind of making money from there, um, whether that's 10 years or, or less. Um, you know, that this is sort of that look. But what if in the middle of it, you have to take a hit and going through this fast you take a hit and you have to repair and take the system off replace it um do that work it's off for a, a week or a month and then turn back on you you've just kind of lost that money you've saved some of that money you saved so now you're back on back on now you're saving money again but you know that that there's less green there than in the previous slide so this just just another sort of way to look at this to show you know metal roofs are really the best really great place to put solar um about the canadian market you know there's of all the metal roofs there's 15 percent of them are metal roofs so there's a lot out there that may be a little bit lower for residential roofs higher but it's higher for commercial and it's growing every year it's been growing three percent per year um the amount of solar the amount of metal roofs in canada um you know it's a stronger roof it resists the weather snow better um so you know it, it's it's you know a growing market so you know the way i view this is you know you guys should go after uh, metal, metal roofs you know commercial warehouses with metal roofs and and sell the fact that th they have the best place to put solar um bar none so that should be really you know i see that as a good part of a sales strategy for um, developers and epcs and installers so let's dive into solar on metal roofs i'm gonna try to pick up the pace here so it ranges from, this is a seven megawatt project that's Apple's headquarters, that is on a standing seam roof with our direct attached PV kit system. And on the right is a, you know, a very tiny residential and everything in between works with solar on metal roofs. Um, so I'm gonna go through the different types. This is actually a rail system, um, a flush rail. Um, and I've circled those rails sticking out for a reason, you'll see that in a second, but basically you know, this is a rail-based system um, we, you know, we support these projects. There's no problem whether you use, you know, Unirack or Snap and Rack or um, Kinetic or other people's rails. We, you know, and and you want to attach it to the metal roof. We have a, a great product for that, and we will support rail pro rail based projects. So, you know, whether and if you buy them from through Baywall, that's great. We will provide free support to make sure that the, you know, it's the right design, the right loads, you know, um, and help you through all that even if it's, you know, whether it's our direct attach or, or a rail based system. So there's no difference to us. Uh, I just wanna make that clear. Um, you know, so here's another one. This is a steep slope, there's the rail. I like to see this picture because it shows the rails before and with a rail base, you have to put all those rails up ahead of time and measure them all. We'll get into that later, but then, you know, the picture on the right is that when the solar is installed. Again, we support these projects. Um, technically, or and um, and we have some partners in the in the space, Unirack and Snap and Rack and others. You know, we they market our products, so they will put their products and pre-assemble them even with our various clamps and brackets we have, and market them. So they they're marketing their rails and say, you know, we're happy to use S5 um, attachments because you know we're the the leader in that space and we do the most testing, we have the most certifications, we really work hard to provide support. So that happens in this world where we have partners, but again, we're you know great to support anything, um, any rails that work. So now direct attach is another type. Um, so this is a steep slope, it could be commercial or residential. This is actually our headquarters um, from many years ago, but this is our direct attach system. So if you look at that circled area and remember back when you're looking at the rails, those, the seams, look like the rails they act just like the rails that's a key to direct attach on metal roofs is that the seam, the seams or ribs um, act like rails act so why put rails on top of rails is our question okay another type is a tilted mount system um you know we have the attachment for that as well those aren't as popular as the as the mar as the module prices have gone down and continue to go down um you know it they, you just want more on the roof when you start tilting it you got to have you have to have space in between for shading there's more hardware involved so it just pencils out that flush works as well as a tilted system in most places you know so but you have to go through that math 
Another type that's been growing is what I would call short rails or mini rails. Um, and again, we support these projects and we're actually partnering with Aero Compact. But basically, if you look at where those little pieces of rails are, they basically take the rails and just chop them up and put the rails only where you need them. That's how I define a short rail or mini rail. Um, so they're out there, that's growing as well. Again, you know, uh, with Aero Compact, they pre-assemble their short rail on some of our clamps and, and sort of market those together. But again, we provide that, we will provide the full support using our testing and you know, to technically help anybody who wants to do this. All right, so now let's get into the uh, Railis, our direct attach system. This is that same picture. Again, I'm just showing this because um, with rail systems, you have to first install all the rails and measure them all and then install the solar, whereas with Railis, you do not. Um, so here's more rails. This is a three megawatt on a roof in, in near me in Massachusetts. Um, you can just see all those rails. Here's the direct attach. So I'm gonna go start going faster through these. So this is our PV kit. And again, it attaches the standing seam or, or exposed fasten ribs. Um, with the variety of products that we offer, the attachments, and it's there's just no need for rails with this. It directly attaches the module frame to the metal roof. Here's another version of it. So this is in a high wind area. High wind pressure could be a high altitude or or just the conditions near the ocean or near a mountain, I guess, and or it could be a high building height. So we you know we that we needed three clamps per side to hold it down. Um, from the wind forces. So, but all we had to do is add another um, clamp. But if you had a rail system, you'd have to add another third rail at every row of products. So six clamps per module, three per side. Another picture of something very similar. This is the mother of all projects. I showed a snippet of this. This is that Apple seven megawatt project. It is standing seam. It is our product. So there's 100,000 points of attachment without a single hole, no ballast, and the warranty, you know, no warranty issues with this. This is probably still the biggest project we've done. We've been, you know, our product's been involved with. Anyway, this is our headquarters. We, this is what I call the drink our own Kool-Aid slide. So this is, you know, we have over 200 kilowatts of solar on this. Um, and, you know, it's all using our direct attach. Um, the canopies and the um, top, and this was done in two parts. Our headquarters, two summers ago, we put um, 53 kilowatts on our headquarters. Of course, there's a metal roof. We used our direct attach. That's Pike's Peak in the background. This is Colorado Springs. Mark, we have a question here. Uh, yep. Graham's asking, with the PV kit, what do you recommend for cable management? Any skirting available recommended for the lower edge? I'll get, yeah, we do have skirting on the lower edge. Yep. And I'll get into the wire management part. Thank you. Yep, for sure. So this is our PV kit. The bottom, the bottom plate is a listed device for um, bonding and grounding 2703. We're actually about to get, we're within, I think we're already done with it, but we have now our, ULC Canada 2703 listing. So that should, you know, it's been, um, you know, a while coming. We did some, had to do a lot of testing for it, but that's done. So now it should be easier in, in Canada for approvals, permitting, um, because we do have now this, the ULC. So the quick benefits and features, you know, these are partially assembled. They'll fit a frame that's anywhere from 30 millimeters to 46 millimeters thick. One tool. You know, the key to this is there's less weight. This is 80% less weight than rails, basically. There's more load distribution because you actually have more connections to the roof itself. Um, no measuring, we'll get into that. You save time because you're not measuring on the uh, on the roof, it's on the fly. We'll get into all that. Um, and it's, you know, as I said, it's listed at 2703. It's made of aluminum and stainless. Um, anyway, so this is a interest, good picture of it, a side view. You can see the pictures in the back. Those are mid clamps. The ones in the front here are edge clamps. So there's actually two top grabs that we use, one for mid and one for end. And that end, that slot is where you would put in the, um, the, the skirt for the front edge, actually. You just asked for that. All right. So 
I'm going to dive back into roofing and, um, and Brandon and Michelle can dive in anytime. I'm not the biggest roof expert, but basically there's two types of metal roofs. Standing seam is one of them. The other one is exposed fasten, which is what you think of trapezoidal or corrugated. So we're going to talk about standing seam first. So it's, it's always two pieces that overlap like that. And then the, the, they're connected to the roof underneath with a clip. You can see that silver part is a clip. So that's screwed into the roof, the structure, and then they're clipped over it. So there's from the top, you do not see any holes. So that's non-penetrating. There's no holes in this roof to attach it. So first I'm going to show you a little video on the mechanical, uh, 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 mechanical seam. And you can watch this. Okay. So one piece goes down, the clip goes in, that's now attached to the roof. The next piece goes over it. So every panel has one on either end, a different one, and then it gets seamed. So this is a standing seam roof. That's, that's what happens. And that machine on the bottom left is what just made that, but you can also do hand, hand seamed. So the, the second one is snap lock, which is there's no seaming. One snaps over the other. Other than that, it's very similar. These are more popular with residential, actually, residential roofs. But it's the same thing. You have a, one side. The clip goes in, fastens down, that's what holds it down, and then the next part just pops over it. There's no seaming. So a little bit less labor to install it. Third type is a applied lock or batten cap where you're putting two pieces together, putting the clip in, both pieces go in, and then a cap goes over the top of it. Same concept, just a little bit different. Okay, those are the three basic types of standing seam roofs. The key is these are traditionally higher end metal roofs, um, and there's no. The key is there's no holes, and they're arch and they're usually you know they're more structurally sound than other types of metal roofs. So the clips, I'll do this really quick. You have a two component clip which is for longer roofs where that you have thermal expansion and contraction so that those can slide back and forth and adapt to all that. That's what's underneath. It's actually two pieces that slide, or there's a single piece. And this is more common on residential short roofs um, where you, that's just not that big of an issue. You can see that the bumps, that's how you can identify where that clip is. Let me show that again. Um, so you, you can tell where these clips are underneath by just looking at that seam generally. So, you know, the thing, the, the one, uh, one, the one aspect of metal roofs is that there's a ton of profiles out there. I mean, there's a few that are common in, in, in this market, um, but there's a ton of them. And our theory has been we um, design a system, of, an attachment specifically for each type or try to. And the reason we do that is because we find that um, if you do a universal one, it's usually more material, a bigger part. It doesn't install properly and it's not as strong. As you can see, especially this bottom middle one that you really need that little insert to get the best pull out strength. So we focus on designing an attachment that fits all the major roofs out there. That's our that's in our DNA. At Mark, but, sorry, I'm just, Mark, I'm just gonna say, uh, add one thing is that we, sure. at S5, sorry, I, this is Brandon at S5. Um, at S5, we work really closely with um, all the roof, roof panel manufacturers. So we're, they, they um, send us their product to do testing and product development. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an important part of, of us as a company. I was gonna get into that at the end is that we really are part of the solar community as much as, and as much as that, we're a part of that roof, metal roofing community. And we we're, straddle both communities. We're involved in both communities. As, just, Dustin, as Brandon says, we have relationships with the major players in those industries and work with everybody and collaborate to provide the best products. So these are just three common ones, our H90, the H, the V, you know, but we have a plethora of them, as you know. Um, so another big part from day one, we've always had what we call a round point versus a cup point. A lot of people do that now. Um, what that is, a cup point can dig into that roof seam round point doesn't so you just get a better attachment safer to the roof and we've been doing that from day one now other people do it because it's it makes sense so um but as you can see 
um, with that seam, that dimple is created. The dimple is very important. So you have to be able to, through the specified torque in our install manual, can, gets you that dimple. And that dimple is an interlock, a mechanical interlock, which provides the resistance to, to movement. So having that dimple in there is actually critical to how it works. And that round point, again, protects the roof by not cutting it as a cup point would. Okay, so let's get into the other major type, trapezoidal roof fan panels. Screw fastened, those through fastened, there are other names for them. The key is that you have to penetrate the roof to attach it to the roof structure. There's no way around it. And attachments have to follow the same route. So you can see these screws in this picture, that picture. Um, but you know, with proper insulation, they, they do not leak. So they're good, good to go. It's just a different style roof. Um, you know, you see these more on agricultural or, or you know, they're just a little bit low, lower cost than what I was showing you before with standing seam. So I'm also showing you another type. These are growing. This is an, what's called an insulated metal panel. So what it is, it's, it's, it's two skins of sheet of metal sandwiching a polyiso, a, you know, a rigid foam for insulation. And there's two types. This one is standing seam. So these, if you put one next to it, you can crimp it just as, as you would a standing seam roof. The other type is ex, what's exposed fastener, which you can see the high rib on the left, that inner, it goes over the next one, and then you screw through it all the way into the roof. So you have long screws that screw these all the way into the roof. Those are the difference, but those are pretty popular. I mean, Brandon can talk to more of that, but those are popular, especially in this market, because you know this insulation is important to have for, um, for weatherization. And we have solutions for both. Yeah, I, that was yeah. I forgot to say that. I put that there because we come to us because we have answers, help to, to attach to those. Uh, we're the best at it. And we do have a question from Laura. How do I know what type of clamp I need, or what information do I need to recommend a clamp? And I can help answer that. Um, so number one, just let us know um, if you have a, a measuring tape. If you can get a picture of the profile of the roof, if you know the manufacturer and you know the gauge, we can typically find that out for you. But number one rule, you know, we can just call S5 and they'll give it to yeah. us very quickly. Yeah, I and mean, we have a great tech support team. Actually, I'll get into that because we do have an identification tool. I'll show that in a minute. Um, and, and we have a new improved and it's pretty nice. But again, calling us or, you know, going through Matt, Matt's team, um, you know, we can get the right answers and don't hesitate to do that because we want to make sure the right clamp gets put on. And my background, it, and my background, oh, sorry. Uh, and my background is in metal roofing. So if you reach yeah. out to me, I should be able to help yeah. identify. Them. So and what I say there is- a question I mean, from Garth as well. Um, I'm doing a residential solar project that, has a wavy metal roof. Ruki is the manufacturer. Do you have a best product to use for attachment to do and a fall arrest system for metal roofs? So Garth, if you could just send us an email on that, we can definitely, we can take that offline and, and we can get you a solution very quickly. Mark's gonna go through corrugated in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I will. Great, so that's it. My one little thing I like to say is that we know, I mean, if anybody's out there who's, a, when I was, a, I was a kid, I was a comic book geek, believe, believe it or not, <laughs> I'm sure you believe it, but so in anybody who knows Spider-Man, his, his, his mantra is, with great strength comes great responsibility, so we know there's a lot of products, we know that, and we take it very seriously that we want to provide that help, so I relate that to Spider-Man, sorry. All right, so here's some of our products, so you know, I'm going to show you these products. This is for exposed fasten roof. This is our, probably our go-to product for exposed fasten roof, trapezoidal roofs. This is really primarily for rail. So you put an L foot on this and put rail. You, this is really not for our direct attached system. So this is a solar foot. I'm just going to go through a few of these. Um, and, you know, this has a butyl seal, which I'll get into. We use, um, you know, uh, and there's four screws and we have test data to, to tell you how strong it is. but this is really designed for a, a rail-based system. Um, this, these are our rib brackets. The one on the left is, is taller. This one is really made for our PV kit because you can put it on directly on top. And if you put an L foot on it, it gets you're starting to get too high. Um, and the one on the left is really could be used for rail, snow retention, or um, not really snow retention, sorry. 
but for for rails or for um, you know for rail based system. Our protea bracket is probably our most common bracket that we sell because it's more of a universal rib bracket basically. Um, it does it can be used for both rip rails if you flip the l around you can put a side mounted rail on it which is that second one down um or the, the third one down sorry no the second one down um and or our pb kit obviously so this is pretty pretty universally um, can be pretty universally help used this is our most popular product another one is versaguard which is really designed for our snow retention product but it can be used with a side mounted rail and is these all have to be engineered with our data so you know it's really important and we'll get into that is it needs to be engineered from a snow and from us and from wind forces and everything and, and using nbc you know national building code of canada okay here is corrugated so we have two two solutions one is the core bracket which installs into the structure through the bottom this is really more this is for rail based or for snow and then we have um go through this quick this does come with an ma bolt so you can put an l foot on it um, and then we have a core bracket 100t which is really this attaches to the top so this can be put anywhere up and down that rib it does not attach the structure it's not as strong as the core bracket from pull out it really can't be used for snow um, but um, it can be used with um, rails and, and solar and then our 100 TPV is really designed is very similar to that one I just showed you, except it's taller. So if you need something taller, and this is really made for our, our, our direct attach to get a little bit more um, room underneath. So that's for corrugated. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about just some technical details. Our, the fastener technology, if you use self-dilling screws attaching through metal, you get, um, it, it's not as strong and you get fragments of metal that come off because you're really drilling material you're removing material and what ends up is you can get premature rusting on the on the on the roof um, the technology that we use is a self piercer so it punches through that very sharp point it actually creates a little bit more of a thread profile there's a little bit more meat in there so there's a little bit more pull out strength and there's no swarf that fall off pieces that fall off that's all the products that we have that go into the into the through the sheet only not into structure we sell with it these self piercers and they have a they have an epdm washer on them as well to seal yeah so epdm on the bracket and then epdm on the screw so that's good for ones that are out of that floodplain for all the products that go into structure well, this is the EPDM. For the ones that go into structure, we use butyl. Butyl is the best sealant. Um, it never gets hard. It's the same adhesive that's used when the roof is actually installed. Um, and it's, you know, there have been studies done. Actually, the owner of the company, Rob Haddock, years ago did a study on um, uh, old metal roofs out there and how they were doing durability. And, you know, their, their conclusion was this butyl the sealant is really works well long term. Um, this is after 33 years and it's still sticky. We also do um, on all our products, we've done submersion testing, which is really the hardest test to pass from a water leaking test where you have six inches of water and you submerge them, submerge them for like six hours. And if a single drop of water gets through, it fails. And all our products have passed that, as you can see. And Mark, there was a comment made from Dave uh, earlier, perhaps a caution on the CalZip roofs. Please check the clip spacing under the roof deck as many roof installations will not support point loads adequate to install solar. Okay. I, I might be able to answer this. Um, we do have two different style um, uh, clamps for this. We have the, um, we actually developed a new, the ZH, which I mean, we, we don't recommend it being uh, the, the original Z clamp on the clip location, but the ZH, uh, I believe we did get approval from CalZip, but it is a good point to bring up. Uh, you do have to be aware of the clip spacing on CalZip for sure. And that's how we can help you directly. You know, we have test data that 
you know, we can look at these worst case scenarios of, of clip spacing and what the impact of that. Um, so now, you know, this is a previous question. How, what about the ID? We actually have a new improved tool, which is clamp to seam.s-5.com. Um, so you can either select your manufacturer and panel if you know that. So if you know that, you, this is the Butler MR24 roof. It tells you what the, the clamp to use. And then you can go directly to the load data if you need the load data and get a report from that. If you don't, you can hit, I don't know what it is, and you get all these visuals. And then now you can kind of look, as Matt said, if you have a picture of the roof um, you know, and, and a measurement, you can kind of fit it to these. And then this will also take you to the same space of what's the best fit. So this one is this bulb seam. You know, you have the Z, the Z mini, um, the Q for that. So, um, you know, that tool is is actually pr newly improved to be able to facilitate not knowing manufacturers and, and the roof space. Um, but as well, if you want support either through um, Baywa or through S5, if you, as Matt said, take a picture with a ruler, draw it, and, you know, and we can help you. Okay. so. Getting back to direct attach, um, you know, the, the benefits of that are less material, less freight. We, you know, I'll show you there's less labor on the roof, um, reduced handling logistics, but you're not dealing with rails um, and just faster time on the roof and less dead load on the roof. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video of it. So you have to measure the first row, and these can be pre all assembled. I don't know why they put the clamp, but you do you do draw a string, um, snap a line for that first row, which he's doing. Then after that, you don't have to measure anymore. So he's tightening those. Okay, so now. The next row, as you install, you don't, you don't, you're not measuring any more rails. It's you're done measuring. The rest go on on the fly, and the modules, the jig. That's key. So on the fly, he's installing that, putting in, lining it up, tightening it down, and then tightening the top down. It's as easy as that. And you just kind of rinse and repeat. You may jiggle a little bit for your final tightening for aesthetics. That's what he's saying. Um, but I'll show you another. They're going to do one more. All right. So that, so this is really close up. You know, it slides in. Then you tighten it into the roof and tighten it down. That's really it. Okay. So, you know, we did some, we did some project comparisons um to the best of our ability um first of all there's just a lot less products so, so this is a 150 modules in this layout the key to using our direct attach is that it really should be in landscape um so this is the roof size so it, with rails you would use portrait with pv kits it's best to do in landscape that's the difference because you want to be perpendicular to your rails you're perpendicular to your rails in portrait when the rails are there, but if you use the seams as rails, you're perpendicular to the rails by going landscape. And you can just see the discrete clamps. So, you know, we did time assessment um, and looked at materials. Just look at the lo lower bill of material on the right than the left. Um, sort of the summary is less 42% cost of materials, 30% less in labor. This is just the installation part, not the wiring and all that other stuff. You know, a lot less shipping, obviously, and, you know, overall, you know, installed before wiring is, you know, upwards of 40% less of time on the roof. Other factors, the big one is the weight. 85% less weight on the roof with than rails. And then there's more points of attachment generally, so you get more, less lower point loads, the load is spread out more. So this is a visual, this is a, a word is, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a 250 kilowatts of rails 
a project I did years ago, actually. And then this is um, 250 kilowatts of PV kit mounting system. I want to show you this video too. This is a pretty new video from us. Imagine the convenience of fitting all the necessary components for attaching a 50 kilowatt metal rooftop solar array to the back of this. <laughs> With the S5 PV kit rayless solar mounting solution, you get a system that weighs up to 85% less than a similarly sized rail mounting system. Which not only saves you big on shipping costs, also greatly simplifies the installation process. See how much you can save on your next metal roofing solar project by using SX So that's us building our headquarters and we did the work. Okay, so this is um so the support we also provide is is really helping to design these systems. So we can help you um, we have spreadsheets and spit out really nice reports that go through, you know, the NBC calculations for wind uplift, um, snow loads. Um, we can help you through those. This is an example of one. Um, and, and so McCall, uh, Sita is, you know, we have a team of application engineers. They're located in Canada and the U.S., but, you know, we can provide that support, you know, spit out a nice report that can be part of your permit package which has those calculations. We don't sign off, we don't stamp those, but we can provide the data that can be reviewed easily by a structural engineer and stamped. We don't want to drink our own Kool-Aid. Our own Kool so, you know, we, we, we do the calculations that are to code and that can be reviewed. Um, and this is an example of what can be spit out. So we provide that support. This is a system that we did. We, we also have a design tool that we can help you with. We can do that work or help you do it. Um, so, you know, again, with our PV kit, we will provide you know this level of support actually. Um, all calculation of all the forces, make sure the system is designed well. So the key to um, rails are really the interface between. They're not there for structural support. Once they're there, they have to be strong enough, but they're not there. They're really the interface between module dimensions and the roof dimensions. But metal roof seams can act, can perform that same function. Okay, so if you look at a module, this is an older version, but you basically have loading zones, right? Where that you really need to be in those loading zones. So, um, you know, module to module, they're different, but they're similar. Um, you know, you have different ratings for different parts of it. You know, some are allowed, some are not allowed. Um, and then if we look at the roof, so that's the demand side on the roof is the supply side. You know, you have spacings and those are set. You can't control those. So, you know, those are 12 to 24 on a standing seam, maybe even larger trapezoidal roofs. They may be, um, they're definitely more ribs for corrugated and trapezoidal. Those are six to 12 or two and three quarters is the standard corrugated size. Um, so, you know, what you have to do is you have to design with that knowledge and make sure things fit. And we can help you with that as well. So, you know, this is, a, this is our roof in our manufacturing plant and, you know, we this is 40 inch spacing actually, but we were able to do, you know, put everything well properly and, you know, have like, we had a gap, you may need a gap sometime, but overall, you know, it, you know, like if I shoved all those together, I could not add more modules actually. So you just have to do that math. It's just pure math to get through that hurdle of making sure the seams line up with what you're okay with. You may have to add some clamps in the middle, just, to reduce the span sometimes if the cantilever is not um, too short. Um, I don't want to get into more, more of those details, but it can be done. You know, we know people, this person, specifically this installer in Colorado area, he always installs, you know, this, this system. These are 72 cell modules, 24 inch spacing of the seams, and he wants an O&M aisle every other module. So, you know, through installation and O&M after, you get access to everything. It's just much better to deal with. I totally understand if you have to, you know, the need to put them tight together. So, you know, we can help you either way. So these are projects that do have some kind of correction gap in them for seam spacing, but you know, the loss is just minimal amount of loss. Like this one, you really can't tell there's any correction gaps at all, but there's, you know, less than 1% difference from, because of the seam, you know, just the, the geometry, which we talked about. Okay. Getting to wire management, you guys all know this. You know, you have a string, whether that's a string of modules or maybe those you have module level power electronics optimizers, those are also strung together. Um, and you have a trunk cable for microinverters. 
So, you know, you, you may have 10 to 20 modules in a string. Um, within a string, the wires cannot touch the roof. Um, so what do you do? So our PV kit does have a disc on the disc, a slot that you can zip tie to. Um, but what's better, what we talk more about is best practices in, in our insulation. And there's two big steps I'll get into. One of them is module prep. Um, and we, this is great anyway, but it's really important if you don't have rails to zip tie or zip tie onto. So basically this is making sure that the module goes up on the roof, ready to go. You want it in that picture on the right where the conductors are ready to plug into each other so that you don't have to reach under. You know, once our system is a low profile system. So once it's on the ground and installed, you don't want to be reaching under or else you're going to really hate us. So you know we have these best practices one of them is making sure that your modules are prepped and i'll show a little bit a few more pictures of that but um we're getting time is running out so another big part of this is clips i mean a lot of this is clipping up these jumpers and your conductors ahead of time with you know these clips and there's so many clips out there you guys have the best ones you buy um you may have some metal zip ties as well and other types of clip but that you know don't you know, most people will use these as part of this installation with the PV kit, these type of clips. Um, Mark, we have a question here as well yeah. uh, from yeah. Grant. With PV kit, we are still trying to meet the solar module manufacturer's frame cantilever tolerances, correct? Yeah, so we can help, we can help with that. But if we, we've talked to many module manufacturers, if you, if your cantilever is too small, um then you should add a third module if it's too large then you need to play around with the module location on the roof um so please i guess get a hold of us and see if we can help um you know get over these hurdles um, thank you definitely helped a lot of people over time at, from the cantilever and hitting that hitting those loading locations and you know it's not perfect and there may be some cases where it's not possible um so then it's probably better to use a rail based system but in a lot of cases, it's just a matter of playing. As I said, it's a math problem, of sliding things around. Um, you know, starting with a little cantilever, maybe having a gap, and then resetting things. Um, but it's you know we can help with that. Okay, so um, the one on the left is a typical residential. You know, you have a couple strings. As you build, you can just clip up the wires onto the frame and you may have a, a conduit that is really your home run. We don't, you know, that's usually not, a, a, you know, that's not a big hassle there. But once you get into bigger commercial projects where these sub arrays can be a couple hundred modules and you have a lot of strings in them, you know, this is, you see the pluses and minuses, those are all string ends. Those all have to be fed to the inverter and that's where sort of the the pushback comes of like we, a lot of we're used to using rails zip tying all these jumpers that i call them um onto the rails so you know uh, this are these are home runs um so the, another concept that i call strategic string design is like really looking at a combination of your strings and your inverter size to sort of match up the geometry of your of your of uh your uh, the, your your design you know the one on the left you know there's it's a pretty haphazard this is just sequential on the one on the right there's some thought put into it a string and trying to minimize that distance where the you know all these strings the 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 string ends are right at the bottom edge so it's going to be easy to connect those to the home run um so that's kind of the thought process and i'll get a little bit more into that um again you know on residential it's not a big lift to, to get through that uh, if you just have a couple strings, if you have more, you might want it, but the same practices apply um, with, with the commercial size. Again, you can see the one on the right is just a little, seems a little bit more efficient than the one on the left because some thought has been put into it. But that could mean the best thought is um, using, sizing your inverter to match. Like if you have columns of eight, if you get a, uh, an inverter with a string size of 16, you can just go down and back, or maybe down and you have a pull through, one wire coming up, so that the, it's just easier to get your string ends at the perimeter so that you can attach jumpers to them, get them to the home run. That's the key, is getting those string ends to, towards that perimeter of your subarray. 
Um, there's a method that I talk about. I'm going to just jump right to it. It's called, um, I'm going to skip this. It's called a trunk where you put a wire tray. It is low profile, but you can get low profile, low profile wire trays that underneath the, the roof itself, between the roof and the modules. And then that's where you dump all your wires that are coming off your strings. So in this case, you know, you have three wire trays, your, your work's going to be easy. And you can lay those ahead of time. And then just as you lay your module in, you just have to have a small amount of clipping. Um, the one on the right is actually a, this is a three megawatt rail based and they use a wire tray. Look over to the right. That's a wire tray under there where they're, they just want to minimize the amount of zip tying to the rails even. So it's, it's a good practice, a good, good concept. And here it is in practice. Uh, and this is an even better version where you, you have one gap in between a subarray, you split it in two, and then you know your wire trays are actually on the outside of the array. They're not underneath as well. So thoughts like this can be really beneficial. I've you know I've helped a lot of people, and they've been very happy with kind of trying to do these different things and be able to do that with a direct attach and not have to rely on rails. The only, if the only reason you're using rails is to zip tie jumpers to, it's pretty expensive um, wire management. So this is the case where they laid wire trays. This is uh, part of that three megawatt. Um, no, no, this is another one. This is a megawatt it, um, size project. So they laid um, wire trays down. You can see the home run on the bottom edge. Um, you can also see they already put the first row of PV kits in. That's that first row where you have to measure. After that, you don't have to measure. So they're like ready to go. Um, so then the wire trays are there. Now you can see after. So the wire trays are used to, to put the, the jumpers in. So wherever there's a string that's ending anywhere there, it, it gets dumped into this wire tray and then feeds right to that home run. And they really were happy with this. And this is actually going over an eave. <laughs> you know, both sides of this roof had solar on it. Another, so our system we put on our headquarters, we used um, micros, so the trunk cable. So we did lay the trunk cable ahead. We had a clip that fit on our clamp. This is actually for heated wire for metal, for roofs. Um, and we did that ahead of time. So then when we're putting the next module in, we just had to plug in. The modules were prepped. There was no hanging wires. When the modules put in, they, we just had to plug in that trunk cable, clip it up. And it you know, was already off the ground from that clip that's attached to the roof. So products are out there like that that can help as well. This is a bond jumper. Um, so our, our columns are all bonded together from our disc, but column to column, you need to bond them together electrically. And we have a, we resell a product that connects them very easily, top and bottom and, and connects them electrically. All right, so steep slope. Oof. Steep slope. Um, as I said, these are smaller projects. Wire management is really not the pushback. It's more about um, scaffolding and maneuvering around a steep slope roof. Um, I'm showing you sort of just the best practices of, you know, you lay that first module. I'm going to go through this quick. So now the first clamps are laid with the string, okay? First row of clamps. That's that picture from the, I just showed you. They laid that down ahead of time. No more measuring after that. Now when the, you put scaffolding up, when the, um, you build, we really say build column at a time because you can keep that scaffolding in place. And now as you put the module in, the clamps go in on the fly. And then you just build, rinse and repeat and build that column. You're not moving, you still use that scaffolding. Um, so in our headquarters, which was lower slope, we were doing a module every two and a half minutes up a column once we get going. So then you move the scaffolding over, Boom, 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 boom. Do, do the next column and just rinse and repeat. Do the whole system like that. So, and if your module flow comes from the top or the side, you can you can do a row and then do a column and then you kind of just fill in the interior. I'll get a little bit more into that, but this is also possible because the modules are coming from the side. What you don't want to do is if your module's coming from the bottom, build that first row. That's really bad because after that, you're you're climbing over to get more and more modules up there. These are a couple um, testimonials, just saying, you know, this guy was one of our original users of the PV kit in Colorado, and he just that's he that's all he does is use our PV kit with metal roofs. 
These are, um, this is a, one of the first big projects in New Zealand. And they did uh, one and a half minutes a module with a small team. So once you get that rhythm, you're no, there's no rails, you're not measuring, you're just like, you can just walk up a column module after module. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. This is more steep slope. You can just see, you know, it's best to go column, you know, build that column up, walk up, move over, build the next column, just keep going. Or, you know, or if you're tied in, you, you know, depending on the pitch, you can walk around the roof, but you know, this is pretty steep. We have, we want a scaffolding. This just shows the module prep, how important that is. These are sort of ridiculous pictures of what, how hard it is can be on steep slope, whether they're rails. So it's never easy, um, but you know, with best practices, you do not need rails. These are showing people leaning on rails, stepping on rails. It's probably not a good idea anyway, I don't think, but it's not needed. That's another picture of that. So the details of that are the best way to install is you have the clamps in front of you, you put the, the nose in first, you connect what you need to connect, then you drop it, and you then you install the next clamps, and then repeat that sequence. And this is a good picture of that. That's a two for one optimizer. So the module behind it, she had to reach where the, the, the conductors were sticking out from the other one. And then they, she just plugged them in and then they dropped. And then on, off to the right is the stringing of the, of the optimizers from each other. And so those are done as you, as you install. These guys are doing the same thing. They're in, doing the plugging that they need to do as they're lowering it. Because once it's lowered and installed, you don't want to be digging under there. But if you practice this, use this technique, you're, you're golden. This is that skirt I was talking about. So this is called PV Conceal. It attaches to the front end of our PV kit, basically. It's, a, it's an aesthetic shield. So I'm gonna get, go really quickly in the module power electronics. So we, I kind of got into this. Sorry, Mark, we have, we have a question from David. Yep. Um, sure. Has DinoBond been certified with ULC? Last time I checked, it was not. That's a good question. I assume they were. And it is a Dynabond that we resell. Um, I know that they're UL2703 listed. So I, it's something to look, we have to look up and figure out. Okay, well, we'll get back to you on that, Dave, and yeah, clarify. Get back. I mean, another way to do it is to, uh, on the top of every module, just put a lug and then run a single piece of copper across. I mean, that's another way people do it, to connect them all together. Um, but the Dynabond is nice, if, and it's really straightforward if you, if you can do that. I didn't realize that it wasn't listed for Canada. So, uh, you know, optimizers and microinverters, rapid shutdown, uh, you know, are, uh, unless you can't, it, I think it's better, especially with optimizers, is to put them on the module frame. We actually have a product for that, our MLPE mount. And um, what you do is during the prep, you do all that work. So it's ready to go. So by the time that goes on the roof, it, there's no difference whether there's an optimizer on there or not. Um, so, and, and that work down on the roof can be, the roof on the ground or in a staging area can be done in parallel. So your cycle time is the same. They're just bringing up modules that have that clipped in. All the wires are clipped up. They're supposed to be. The conductors are in the position you need to have them in, which is very important. So they can just, the next one goes in, you just plug them together. Um, and, and, you know, you really don't lose time um, using an using a, a optimizer like that. Uh, micros are a little different. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, again, clipping is important. You can, obviously, our clamps can be used, the same clamp you're using to put it on the roof, you, um, you can use... You, you can you can use it to put an optimizer or microinverter on the roof itself. So that's being that's done as well. Um, so so you know, there's no issue with that. But I I think it's better if you can to go on the module frame. Sometimes they're too thick and there's issues with them. But if you can, that's what I think is better. But obviously you can put them on the roof. The picture on the right is our gripper fix, which is our utility product for satellite dishes and HVAC. You can easily use that. That's low profile, and you can put it. Uh, power electronics product on there as well. These are just more pictures of that, putting it on the roof with our various clamps and brackets, same thing as you would use for the ins installation itself. 
Um, micro microinverters are a little different. You have the power trunk, which is not so it, you know, something has to be clipped up on the roof. So basically, you know, either you can install it on the module and tie it, tie up everything, but then you have your power trunk on the roof, which I showed you a picture of, and then you clip up as you go. Or in this case, they put it on the ground. They connected the, the already connected the trunk to it. So when you laid the module in, you just plugged it into the tr into the microinverter and then tucked up the wire. So it's sort of six of one, half dozen of another. Again, I, I just think it's better to do it on the module frame. This is our own installation again in Colorado. That's a micro. Um, we we prep the module. There's nothing that's hanging on that. Those are plugged in as you install them. You put it in the front as you're lowering it in, you plug in that trunk cable, which is lying on that roof ahead of time and clipped up. And then you just clip it up one more time and you're good to go. I mean, we were, in, like I said, we were installing two and a half minutes of a, a module with this setup. Again, here it is. Here's that setup. So the module would go in and that micro would then be pl get plugged into that, would get plugged into that. All right. So we also have solutions for every other aspect, all the bills, you know, power junction boxes, home runs, you know, no different than anything else. I don't want to dwell on that, but you know, you can use our clamps and our, <coughs> and our gripper fix, not necessarily Unistrut um, to, for all these products, walkways and everything. <clears throat> all right, so let's dive into snow. Here's this picture again, this video, just to get everybody, wake everybody up again. So this is, so this is five between five and six tons being evacuated in about under five seconds. I mean, that's the 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 one feature or one you know fact with metal roofs is that um, you know when things get warmed up, that snow will come off. So that's the need for snow retention is the, for life safety. That's the reason that for snow retention. And it doesn't, as I said, it, there's no difference whether you put solar on it or not. So it has to be. Um, so it's an opportunity if there's a roof that doesn't have it. Um, you know, you could put that on when you're putting solar on. What I see is an opportunity. So this is my own house in New Hampshire. I have direct, direct experience with this. This is in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Spring of, 19, of 2019, we had a ton of snow. I'm going to show a little bit of it just to see how tall. That's, a, that's, a, that's my door. Okay, so now I'm going to fast forward it. Okay. So this is the, it all coming down. And that's heavy, heavy wet snow too. And by the way, my I didn't know it at the time, but my deck was broken, ripped off the off the off the house. Okay, so what is what's doing this? So snow builds up on the snow, and you have the, this frictional bond, and then you have a cohesive bond around the top of this, keeping it up. Okay, but then as as it gets warmed up by the sun, it, that that friction goes to zero, and then the bond breaks up top, and then it just comes off. Okay, that's that's what's happening, and so it's no different whether you put solar or not, which I'll show you. But the reason snow guards exist is to control that snow. That's the the reason that industry exists. And, and we've been in we've been in snow retention as long as if actually longer than we've been in solar, making attachments and systems. Um, so it's about safety, liability, all that um, with how with with buildings. Um, you know, these are just examples. You know, damage to vehicles, people, everything, and snow guards are really effective um, because of the compressive strength of snow. Um, a little, a small, our color guard is only like an inch, a couple inches high, but it can hold a ton of snow behind it because the snow kind of builds up and, you know, and, and does, and, and stays up in a controlled way. And that's what's key to it. And, you know, here's solar. So solar doesn't help. Solar is also a slippery surface, especially when it gets warmed up. And there's a little bit, the lip itself on your frame will hold back a little snow, but you know, but pretty much snow will still come off. And you can see that. And you can see on that front part, snow is, because it's being held by back by that gutter, you can see kind of 
probably like a module width is being held on longer than anything else. So, you know, that's a good picture. So that kind of leads us to the best practice. What we say is if you're if you're really designing a system, you need to have a gap between the eave, the bottom, and your first solar. I mean, this is exaggerated, but we say at least one meter or so in most cases. And then you could have snow retention in front if you if you need it for life safety underneath. Um, but you know, the snow will evacuate, pile up at the at the eave or slough off, and then this piling up, it still allows the, the modules to quicker make start making power again. Our snow guard, our sorry, our color guard is a product that is low profile, um, you know, is really well. We have various products. We have X guard, um, you know, Brandon can say more. Um, he's more on, on that side of it. But, um, you know, this stuff will help um, keep that snow up there so people don't get hurt. And if people have a building that doesn't have it, that's a good suggestion is that they, they need to put that on for safety. Um, so in the case where people do put solar right up right up to the eave and don't leave much room, you need to make sure that the snow part, the snow retention part is higher than the solar panel. So colored guard might not work. We have another product called X guard, which is higher. So you could have, besides shading, you could have a, a module a few inches behind that. We, we suggest a gap for sure, but you could have it closer but you need to have this has to be higher than the solar <clears throat> and this product is a good fit for that but we have various products again um, so th this is for sort of the big best practice is to, is to control that snow and try to clear off the solar panels by having a gap we help with this again we provide this free service um, this is in national building code um, the snow load and what that means as far as the forces on the roof we can help you through that we can do that um, then also we can we have a snow calculator that takes those numbers and actually tells you how you know what you need and how many you need to prevent that snow um, from falling and in conjunction with a solar system as well. I'm not going to dwell on that, but you know that we provide that help. We can provide that help. Uh, another big pra best practice is not to have too high of a moment arm. This is our protea bracket with an L foot on top. That we do not suggest that they do that. Our protea bracket, if you flip that over, can easily attach that rail, it would be lower. Lower profile, less of a moment. So you see this picture on the right, it's bent over from the from just from snow, bending that over. So that's a big issue. And the more snow load, the bigger an issue it is to have a high moment. So that's another big thing to think about is how high of this, what kind of contraption you have here, <laughs> basically. Um, so in the analogy is to a hammer, the longer, the longer you are away, you know, the longer handle you have, basically, the easier it is to pry up a nail. So the higher the solar is above this fulcrum, the easier it's going to be to rip this out of the roof or to bend this, bend these. The load, the stress goes up, the higher it is. Okay. So I'm going to end with just sort of a few thoughts on S5. Um, so um, Rob Haddock is the founder. He's a legit cowboy. If you didn't know that, he rode rodeo growing up. His kids ride rodeo. Um, he was a metal roof expert who invented the clamp. So that standing seam clamp over 30 years ago, he invented it. He was the first person to do that. He had the patents. He built a company around it. Um, he's also a renowned consultant and educator in metal roofs and um, attaching things to metal roofs. <clears throat> a lot of the patents have run out, so there are competitors in there, but we are really still the leading company. And, you know, and Rob Haddock, you know, I'm really Happy to be working for him. Um, the things we're proud of, um, you know, we do a ton of testing. I mean, that's what we're really known for is doing a ton of testing. We keep up with certifications is getting a big, be a bigger challenge um, to keep up with certifications and listings. Um, you know, we have seven, more than seven gigawatts out there of products solar with our, some form of our product on it. Uh, and then you see we 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 went from a 25 year to a lifetime warranty on all our products. It's a great good thing for you guys. Um, and again, we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, with these industries, um, being a leader. Like we don't just, you know, belong to these committees and sit there. We we take leadership roles in both the solar and roofing, metal roofing. Um, and we, you know, we, we collaborate with a lot of these entities, and we work. We're, and that's something that one of the reasons I came 
the S5 was I knew Dustin, his son, who was also involved in a lot of these, and that was something that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm passionate about that and about customer service and S5, we do all that. You know, so we have a certified manufacturing 9000 ISO 9001. We get we get audited all the time by TUV, UL, FM, ICC. So we have to have our, you know, our stuff together <laughs> for quality systems, and we do. Um, it's pretty cool. To, you know, I'm pretty proud of our plant as well in Texas, where everything is made. These are the. This is old. Brandon and Michelle have reminded me that this is outdated but that you get the gist that we spend a lot of time on the metal roof side, working with a bunch of partners, roof manufacturers, making sure we have products that they like and they endorse. That's very important to us. Yeah, what's missing is a lot of the Canadian manufacturers that you guys deal with that that are that all should be included in that. So Brandon made me show it fast. I can't go back to it. So this is our this is our manufacturing plant. If it looks like a Walmart, it's because it was a Walmart that was con we bought and converted to manufacturing plant. We have since expanded, which I showed you that picture of the expansion, and you know that's um, so that that's it really. And then I will show you though these are my colleagues that are on in the background. You can hear you heard Brandon, Michelle's there as well. These are our frontline people in in Canada along with uh, McCall, um, and this is their contact information. Brandon has never bought a comb, by the way. But other than that, so yeah, everybody, awesome. you, got, you can you, feel free to reach out to me if you do have any questions. Michelle had to jump off. We're actually heading out to a, a meeting, so. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I'm a phone guy, so call me or text or or email, whatever. Thanks, guys. Well, that, really appreciate. So so that wraps it up. Uh, appreciate your help. Um, is there any more lingering questions or? No questions are good. Just a couple of reminders on the way out. Uh, if you folks haven't signed up for our web shop yet, please do. You can find all the specs, pricing, uh, install manuals, uh, volume, pay for your orders. All of that is on the web shop and it's always advancing and is really a powerful tool for you all as we want to be an extension of your procurement team. This was also recorded, so it will be on our YouTube channel today. It'll also come out in the newsletter. If you have any follow-up questions, please do not hesitate. Call one of our reps. We're well-versed in S5 or S5 directly. And thank you again, S5. Truly great partner. Um, one of the class uh, organizations out there. And yeah, thank you. Same thank goes you, Matt. for us. We appreciate yeah, working with you with Baywa. Yeah, thank you, Baywa. And thanks for everybody who was involved in organizing this. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you.